Good morning, everyone. It is my honor here to discuss um, just a fabulous child trainee. So Dr. Ismet Reza Niazi is a superlative. He is that rare combination of intelligence, compassion, and charm poured into someone who truly wants to change the world. Dr. Niazi graduated from Nebraska Wesleyan University and attended the University of Nebraska for medical school. He moved to DC to complete his adult psychiatry residency at Georgetown University and was recruited to our UCLA Child Psychiatry Fellowship shortly thereafter. He currently serves as chief fellow and has infused such life and vigor into an unprecedented intense year to say the least. He is an incredible clinician educator as evidenced by multiple awards beginning in medical school, such as the Frank Menolacino Award for Excellence in Psychiatry, the Hugh H. Hussey Award for Excellent Medical St School Student Teaching and Mentorship, and the Spirit Award for Demonstrating Outstanding Values in Regard to Patient Care. In his spare time, he also serves on the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Programming Committee, was a top-rated UCLA PBL tutor in psychiatry, and recently gave a powerful grand rounds for the UCLA Child Division entitled Social Media from Clout to Connection, an Afghan American Story. It is so fitting that Dr. Niazi was voted by the UCLA Child Division as the 2021 Gertrude Rogers Greenblatt Award recipient, as he provides exemplary care and unwavering support to the lives of children and families seeking psychiatric care. We are so proud of Dr. Niazi for his leadership, his authenticity, and his spin positive approach to life. We are excited to watch him launch his career at Adelphi Psychiatry upon graduation, and even more excited for the fortunate children and families who will benefit from his compassionate approach to psychiatric care. Congratulations, Dr. Niazi, our 2021 Green Black Fellow. Wow. Dr. Misty Richards, thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored, overjoyed to know the past winners of this award and to know my own colleagues who I was up against um, in consideration. I'm just really humbled by it and just so honored to have received it. Thank you to UCLA. Wonderful human being, congratulations. And now for Dr. Laura Halpin for the Grand Rounds introduction. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Laura. I'm one of the uh, child fellows and I've had a chance to work with Dr. Harris through the AMA and we're so excited she accepted our, our invitation to speak today. Um, before getting into her intro, um, I did wanna share a little bit more with you all about uh, Gertrude Rogers Greenblatt um, for whom this memorial lecture is named after. So this lecture was established in 1985 by the family, friends, students, and colleagues, and it honors the lifelong achievements and contributions of Dr. Gertrude Rogers, Raj Greenblatt, and her husband, Dr. Milton Greenblatt. The lectureship is paired um, with the fellow award, um, which Misty just presented. Uh, and so Dr. Rogers had a distinguished career in academic child psychiatry. As an administrator, um, she was a pioneer um, and a very powerful woman in academic medicine in her day. Dr. Greenblatt graduated from Radcliffe College, studied medicine at Tufts University, where she was one of only two women in her medical school, school class. And that was also where she met her future husband, Milton Greenblatt. Dr. Rogers Greenblatt joined the staff of Harvard's Massachusetts Mental Health Center, where she rose to become director of training in child psychiatry. She is remembered as an inspiring and gifted teacher by generations of trainees, for her consummate clinical skills in the treatment of seriously disturbed children and for her effectiveness as a mentor. In 1959, Dr. Greenblatt was appointed director of the Gabler Children's Center in Waltham, Massachusetts. Dr. Greenblatt transformed the center into a modern, humane, and evidence-based program improving the lives of hundreds of children and families in her care. On the occasion of the Gertrude Rogers Greenblatt Lecture, it is also an appropriate time to acknowledge the career of her, her late husband, Dr. Milton Greenblatt, who is also a distinguished psychiatrist and an outstanding member of the psychiatric community in Boston and later in Los Angeles, including here at UCLA. We're delighted today to have the honor of Dr. Patrice Harris join us as our Greenblatt Lecture. Dr. Patrice Harris, a renowned child and adolescent psychiatrist from Atlanta, um, served as the 174th president of the American Medical Association 
and as the first African-American woman to hold this position. As a private practicing physician, public health administrator, and patient advocate, Dr. Harris has been an, ad, an, excuse me, an active leader in organized medicine for her entire career. She served on the AMA's Board of Trustees since 2011, including a term as chair. She also served as chair of the AMA's Opioid Task Force since its inception in 2014. Beyond the AMA, Dr. Harris has held positions of leadership within the American Psychiatric Association, the Georgia Psychiatric Physicians Association, the Medical Association of Georgia, and the Big Cities Health Coalition. A distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, Dr. Harris continues in private practice and currently consults with both public and private organizations on service delivery and emerging trends in healthcare. She is an adjunct ad assistant professor in the Emory Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and an adjunct clinical assistant professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Harris is a West Virginia native and she earned her master's in counseling psychology and MD at West Virginia University. It was during this time that her passion for helping children emerged and she completed her psychiatric residency and fellowships in child and adolescent psychiatry as well as forensic psychiatry at the Emory School of Medicine. And with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome AMA immediate past president, president, Dr. Patrice Harris. Thank you, Laura. It's so good uh, to see you. And it's good to at least see everyone virtually. We had big plans for my grand rounds in person, but of course, COVID has changed a lot of our plans and a lot of our lives, but it does not uh, make the honor and the opportunity uh, any uh, less privilege, at least uh, for me. I also want to congratulate Ismet uh, on uh, his award and his commitment, right, to, uh, and this is uh, where our new virtual uh, world allows us to be in lots of places at one time, and so his commitment to our patients, to our profession, and uh, to the receipt of this award. And so it's also, thank you, Laura, for talking about the Greenblatts, because I think it's always critical to get centered on why we do what we do, and where we are uh, today, and, and why and who we honor folks who have come before us. So I have a few slides today just to talk about the issue of leadership. And really, it's it's leadership as metaphor, right? And so I, I believe that there are so many opportunities for, for leadership, large and small. And of course, I had uh, the opportunity, I'll share my screen as I uh, do my introductions here. I had the opportunity to have a large leadership opportunity. I had the opportunity uh, for the privilege, the platform of the privilege of the American Medical Association, but certainly uh, leadership can occur every day, can occur and does occur every day um, within each of our own spheres of influence. And so as I talk about the ways in which AMA has led, I will also be bringing in other opportunities and I hope stimulate your thinking on ways, by the way, I know that you are already leading, but ways you intend to lead going forward, because as this slide shows, we are in an urgent moment. You all know that you've lived that there in California, but on so many levels, and I think you all know as a country, we have a short attention span. So first of all, we tend to careen from crisis to crisis, uh, throw sometimes money at an issue with good intentions, no, no doubt. Uh, but again, we, we tend to be in reactive and crisis mode. And really, as we move forward, we have to be in proactive, sustained, problem solving mode. And so absolutely there's an urgency of the moment now, but many of us and all of us in this room today uh, will have to continue to lead on issues. I'm often asked, Patrice, Dr. Harris, sometimes in interviews and uh, in the media, uh, do you think we will get back to normal? And when I'm asked that question, I say, I hope not because I think uh, that we can all agree that in many ways, our pre-pandemic normal was not acceptable. And so hopefully I'll do some stimulating of your thought about what a post-pandemic, what I call transformed 
normal should look like, but I uh, am pragmatically optimistic and I'm pragmatically optimistic because I know uh, that it's going to require leadership to get us to that transformed normal. So I'm happy to talk a little bit about opportunities for leadership, stimulate your thinking about next steps and that transformed normal. But of course, I try to practice gratitude every day. That's one way I practice self-care. And so I want to start with thanking you. I want to thank all the healthcare heroes in the room. And by the way, when I say healthcare heroes, I do mean those physicians and nurses and respiratory therapists that were on the front line. But you know who else were our healthcare uh, heroes? Of course, all of the mental health professionals, but I consider uh, the folks who made sure that our facilities and hospitals were clean and made sure that those who are working there, again, particularly in the uh, beginning of this pandemic, but now throughout, as we are still negotiating our way through this new phase, um, who help make sure uh, we as health professionals are able to do our jobs, taking the best care of patients. So I just thank you. Of course, uh, this is a, a slide from the AMA. And of course we are a physician led organization, but I, I know this is an audience full of a diversity of health professionals at all uh, phases of career. I know we have medical students uh, as well as trainees and, and physicians. And so I wanna just thank everyone uh, and it was just my honor and privilege to lead uh, and have this platform during during COVID. Um, you know, I um, people ask me about my presidency during COVID, and of course, who knew uh, when I uh, was here in June on the night of my inauguration, June 2019, none of us could have predicted uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. But I have to say, I, I do believe I was the right person, the right place at the right time as president of the American Medical Association. And so this night, yes, was my inauguration. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the AMA, we do have a very formal process. Uh, we have a very formal uh, transfer of leadership. And there is a, and I, uh, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, it was the last, fortunately for me, unfortunately for Dr. Sue Bailey, who's the current president, and Dr. Jerry Harmon, who will be uh, president next month. I'm in my last six months here, but I had the privilege of that ceremony that night. And that night I talked about bringing all of who I was and am into the role. I talked about being an African-American, being a woman, uh, being a native West Virginian, but of course uh, being a current Georgian and ATLian, that's how, what we call ourselves in, in Atlanta, ATLian, but also a psychiatrist. Uh, and I am the third psychiatrist, was the third psychiatrist and the first child and adolescent psychiatrist to be president of the American Medical Association. And for those of you who know, you know that I did not wake up one day, uh, I didn't even wake up in 2018 and decide to be president of the AMA. That was a 30 year commitment, uh, but it was a not a commitment of mine alone. The American Psychiatric Association, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Academy of Child, and Adoles uh, uh, Child Psychiatry and the Law, Apple, we got together and we uh, had a strategic plan and we wanted to have psychiatrists um, in every committee, on every committee, task force, and every level of leadership at the AMA. And we made a plan 30 years ago uh, that we uh, wanted to have a psychiatrist someday from the delegation, from the uh, psychiatry delegation. My good friend, Dr. Jerry Lazarus was the second psychiatrist, but he came from his state uh, delegation from the Colorado delegation. And so we wanted to have, again, psychiatrists in every level of leadership, but also one day uh, to be the president. And so we had a strategic plan and we plotted and planned and hard work, commitment, and, and I have to thank Laura because Laura was so helpful uh, in my run uh, for this office. So I wanna give a shout out, uh, to, a special shout out to Laura. But yes, this was the night and I talked about the fact that I wanted to raise, to amplify three issues. Of course, in addition to AMA's three strategic priorities, improving health outcomes, accelerating change, 
in medical education and improving physician satisfaction and practice sustainability. Those are the three overarching uh, strategic arcs of the American Medical Association. But I also, also wanted to elevate three things. The first, the importance of mental health into overall health care. Second, uh, the importance of diversity of the physician workforce. But of course, there's an uh, analogy there. We should have diversity in all of the workforce of health professionals. But I pointed out that night uh, that I wanted to use my platform for the year uh, to elevate, uh, unfortunately, uh, the lack of diversity in the physician uh, workforce. Uh, but not just as a checkbox, right? Not just to satisfy numbers, but really in the service of health equity. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. The third issue I wanted uh, the opportunity to amplify was the importance of and addressing childhood trauma. Now, again, uh, never would any of us have wished COVID-19 on our world, but those three issues have been raised and elevated, health inequities, the importance of mental health and trauma, uh, not just childhood trauma, but trauma uh, overall. So yes, I do think that I was in the right uh, place at the right time. And I hope um, that my leadership during the year was impactful um, on those areas and other areas that I will, will talk about. I also like to use this slide to take a moment to remind each of you to practice self-care. Delete my photo here and put your picture in place of that and remember that every day. Uh, it's cliche, yes, what we hear on planes as we are beginning to get back on uh, planes uh, that we should take care of ourselves, put our mask on first before helping others. And I think this actually has been elevated. We already were seeing an increase of uh, medical student and, and physician uh, suicide. Um, and we saw, unfortunately, some uh, physician uh, suicides during COVID. Um, and so we really uh, know that we operate in a system, and I'll be talking a lot about systems that don't always incentivize us, healthcare professionals in general, to take care of ourselves. So this is just a reminder uh, to take care of yourself um, every day as we are taking care of others. And so again, I'll talk a little bit about the AMA's pandemic response, but really as a metaphor, right, for the importance of leadership and how we should all be thinking about leadership because it's COVID-19 today, it's mental health today. It was before uh, COVID that's been amplified. Health inequities are not new. And so there is a lot on our uh, to-do list and how should we uh, think about a response, a cogent uh, response. I gave a TED style talk uh, several years ago and the, the theme of the talk was what if, and I asked the question, what if we approached all public health issues, crises. Again, this was before um, COVID, and I was particularly talking about the opioid epidemic, but again, it is um, attributable or op uh, it is um, important and serves well as a model for any public health crises. And the first is intellectual honesty to make sure we are uh, having conversations that are intellectually honest conversations. The second is science and data. And the third is sort of digging deep against the, the, the misinformation that we all have to address on, on, on many uh, issues. And so clearly what we wanted to do at the AMA and uh, what we have the opportunity to do in any crisis is to be a trustworthy source of information. We've seen the critical importance of that when we think about vaccines, but early on about testing. Uh, the data do show uh, that health professionals still are trusted. Uh, certainly there's been an erosion of trust in institutions and even in, in health profession and particularly the medical profession. Nurses have the highest rating physicians uh, follow behind, but health professionals, we are trusted. And so people expect us and we must make sure that we are always providing evidence-based resources. And that's what the AMA uh, endeavor to do. But of course, uh, in order to be trusted, you must be trustworthy. We always have to keep that in mind. Clearly, it was to help physicians and practices recover uh, from the disruption. This disruption continues um, early on in the pandemic. I and other leaders met with the um, 
president at the time, President Trump and Vice President Pence about what we needed. Of course, you all recall well, and I, I would be interested to see um, how things are with PPE there. We know that's much less of a problem now, but you know, uh, we did not have PPE uh, that we needed and, and, and physicians and other health uh, professionals were even uh, being uh, punished and penalized uh, for telling the truth, truth telling. Uh, but again, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were supporting physicians and practices in their recovery through funds uh, and through our work uh, throughout all systems. We wanted to reduce obstacles to patient care. And I'll just give you a quick example about opioids. Uh, certainly we had to uh, change to a new business model. I don't know about you. I was using telepsychiatry before, uh, but certainly it has accelerated during the pandemic, but there were many obstacles. There were payment inequities. We also uh, had to use certain platforms and we were able to work, of course, with other partners uh, to get uh, Meta CMS uh, to allow phone uh, consultations because we know not everyone has the privilege of a data plan or even a laptop. Now, now uh, because of virtual learning, many schools were able to get laptops, but I think it's always good to go back and recall uh, where we were uh, pre-COVID. And as always, uh, we should be advocating for science-based policies. You know, we think a lot and we make recommendations based on the science to our patients. We don't always require policy uh, to be evidence-based and the AMA, uh, has been particularly keen to hold to account policymakers to uh, make sure that they are basing policy recommendations based on science and the data, and that these policies are not just policies, uh, but and they don't worsen health inequities, uh, but they allow us uh, to eliminate uh, or work to eliminate health inequities. Certainly, that's not going to happen overnight. I had the privilege of uh, being uh, in the spotlight on the media, but the message on several uh, opportunities, again, early on, it seems almost um, routine now and rote now, but at the very beginning, uh, people had not uh, had the opportunity to really focus in on the importance of science and the evidence of fact, and I had the opportunity to do that. Uh, on a lot of TV shows. And in fact, uh, you know, towards the end, I think people were sort of sick of seeing me, but it, it was a wonderful opportunity. Uh, but clearly COVID-19 elevated issues around health inequities. And in some ways this was a bit um, unusual uh, because typically we have an appreciation of these inequities way after the fact, because often we don't have the data early on, but we did have some data. It was incomplete. It is still incomplete regarding race and ethnicity. And so we were able to see that unequal impact early on. And of course, uh, AMA and other partners called on HHS and CDC and states and local public health departments to make sure they were collecting this data and disseminating this data. And right, it's not only race and ethnicity, it's gender, it's zip code. My frustration early on was lack of access to testing. And I saw the few testing opportunities we know that there were uh, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, those testing opportunities were not available to the communities that needed them the most. And then there were issues around transportation, again, not new. When we talk about food, uh, living in food deserts and food insecurity, a lot of issues are, uh, revolve around transportation. And we've seen with vaccines, and your colleague there in California, uh, Dr. Jerry Abraham, one of our a fantastic uh, AMA uh, leaders was able to elevate that and talk about this in the media and, and talk about the fact that we needed to make sure that we were bringing vaccines to the community. So bringing testing community, vaccines to the community, mental health services to the community. I'd be interested to see, um, you know, what you all are doing there regarding bringing mental health to the community. I'll share a quick story. Uh, when I was a, a child psychiatry uh, fellow, and we were lamenting the fact one day that we had about a 70% no-show rate uh, to the clinic. And, uh, you know, folks, the original conversation was focused on the people who weren't showing up. And I remember thinking and saying, 
perhaps we should look at how difficult it is to get to us, right? To navigate all the systems, to navigate transportation. If you don't have the availability of daycare, if you have more, if you don't uh, have more than one uh, child to pay for perhaps uh, public transportation uh, for three instead of one. So I'll, I'll talk about this a little later, but we really have to look at inverting the burden of negotiating our systems and not waiting for people to come to us uh, for care. Clearly uh, we are, as relates to COVID, in the phase of getting more and more uh, folks vaccinated. We need vaccines in arms. Done a pretty good job. We're seeing a lull here. Of course, you know, the FDA yesterday approved the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15, I think. The Advisory uh, Committee on Immunization Practices is meeting today, I think to, or if not today, tomorrow, uh, to uh, approve the use in 12 to 15 year olds. And I think that's, that's a, a, a critical step forward. Um, we know that everyone won't uh, get vaccinated and we have a role here, right? Again, this you see physician here, but this is everyone in this room has a role. You may have a role in your family, you may have a role in, in your faith community, uh, in local organizations that you belong to, but if clearly as health professionals, people trust us, they come to us, and we do have a role in increasing uh, the adoption of uh, the vaccine. Earlier today, I did a, uh, a TV uh, interview on Bloomberg, and he, Bloomberg, and he, uh, the host asked me what we needed to do. And one of the things I think we certainly should stop doing is talking about those who have, have not yet decided to get a, vac a vaccine as if they are a monolithic community, right? We know there are those who aren't getting a vaccine because of politics. We know there are those who aren't getting a vaccine because they have more questions, appropriate questions. We know there are those who are not getting a vaccine because they don't have access, it's not easily accessible. And so we really need to, of course, not have a one size fits all, but meet people where they are. Uh, but we have a leadership role, all of us in this room, in vaccine adoption. And by the way, this would go for any um, issue as any public health issue. We are trusted uh, professionals and we uh, can go a long way. What we say, our message, getting the facts out, right? Being transparent uh, can go a long way in working with uh, the community. The good news is there is growing vaccine acceptance. As an African-American woman, I wanted to make sure that I uh, talked to uh, communities of color. I, when I went to get my vaccine, I posted it on, on Facebook. I know for the younger folks in the audience, Facebook is passe, but I just haven't graduated to, to Instagram yet. But it was important uh, to be a trusted messenger, again, to be transparent. I talked about my side effects. I did have side effects uh, the second time and for eight hours, well worth the vaccine. But we Again, we are seeing this growing vaccine acceptance. The other point I made today in my interview is we have to be persistent. This is not a one and done. And actually when we think about any community intervention, uh, we have to stay in the community. We have to have sustained efforts, you know, uh, for far too long, you know, so why, you know, let me just particularly talk about the African-American community. And we know the issues around the US Public Health Service a study at Tuskegee. And by the way, I, I say that it's a mouthful. It would be easier to say the Tuskegee syphilis study, but Tuskegee, which is a historically black uh, college, Tuskegee did not uh, uh, sponsor that study. That study was sponsored by the United States Public Health Service. And so, you know, we have to make sure that we acknowledge uh, those issues and why there might be that mistrust and distrust and work on that as well. And as a part of that, again, just our work, just uh, trying to be exemplar of the AMA. Uh, we partnered with the Ad Council and some other groups to boost uh, vaccine confidence. Did the same thing for the flu vaccine. I've done the same thing regarding the opioid issue. So it's about meeting people where they are. Again, not a one size fits all message. Um, the messenger has to be uh, trusted and the message has to be appropriate and tailored to the community. But again, clearly uh, we uh, have seen these inequities. 
And we have to start upstream. We have to talk about the upstream, the farthest upstream determinant of these inequities. And fortunately, uh, although a difficult conversation for some, although an uncomfortable conversation for some, we have to talk about racism. But when you heard me mention intellectual honesty before, one of the things I see all the time is folks having a conversation and later on in the conversation, it is clear that there's not a shared definition. So here's a definition, uh, past president of APHA, uh, Dr. Kamara Jones put forth this uh, definition of racism. I think it is a great definition. Certainly doesn't necessarily have to be the only definition. The point here is when we are discussing these issues, let's at least agree to a shared definition of what we are discussing. Now, I will add one more thing here. As, as you are um, at, at hopefully at UCLA, and I know that you are having these conversations from an institutional level, perhaps even the Department of Psychiatry is having these uh, conversations. I, I know that I am actually doing a little bit of work with Columbia uh, and Dr. Uh, uh, Jeff Lieberman about uh, you know, what can the department do? And it, sometimes these conversations are uncomfortable, as I said, uh, but here's one thing though, in addition to having a shared definition, I urge you to have a commitment to at least coming to the conversation informed. I can tell you that as an African-American woman, so often folks come to me and want me to explain. And by the way, although it can be exhausting, I am happy to do so, but one of the things I require is folks come to the conversation having done some homework, you know, having read CAST or, uh, you know, one of the other uh, books on um, how to be an anti-racist or what racism is about. And I actually don't, um, well, and so folks, it, it's not a require. I can't make anyone do anything, but what I can do is decide who I will spend my energy candidly uh, having conversations uh, uh, to whom I have the, uh, with, I have these conversations. And so uh, please, uh, those of you who are interested, uh, let's make the commitment to have a shared understanding of a definition and also uh, having done some homework. Um, you know, I like this slide. It's a, a, a public health framework from the Bay Area Regional Health and Equities Initiative. Most of us in this room know this, know this information. Most non-traditional healthcare audiences don't. And it's important to demonstrate all of the determinants of health. And I think we can see this on this slide. So it is whether or not you have health insurance, absolutely. It is whether or not uh, you have access uh, to care, but it's also where you live, right? Transportation, as I said, food insecurity, but it's also policies and practices. Now, one thing we talk about is the social determinants of health. So we, we start with uh, racism and structural racism, which then has created uh, these social determinants of health that we know impact uh, whether or not, again, you uh, have education is one of those. And if we stop just a quick moment though, and this is where we have to dig beneath the headlines to really understand. If you think about how we fund education in our country, we fund education a lot, public ed education with property taxes. If you live in a community where the property is our value lower, less property taxes are collected, less resources for uh, public education. And so if you go further upstream, well, how did that happen? And think about our interstate system, which was built straight through uh, many communities of color, uh, mostly black communities at the time, but communities of color, which reduced property values and also contributed to what? Poor air quality. And so again, it's, in, and, and of course, why, and in addition to that, redlining, discriminatory lending practices. So again, policies and practices and laws um, all contribute to where we are today. And I, I like this slide because it's a good representation of all of the determinants of health. And we need to talk about those upstream, midstream and downstream uh, determinants. And again, each of you on this call can decide where you fit in here, what you're passionate about, what you want. It's a lot of things, pick one. Um, and, the, and then decide to advocate for that in either your small sphere of influence there or the larger sphere of influence. And by the way, 
Um, I, I do uh, recommend folks, I was a lobbyist, a full-time lobbyist at one point during my uh, career. And I realized that not everyone uh, can do that, but I urge you at the very least, your uh, legislators should know who you are. You should absolutely know who they are. They should know who you are at the state and the federal level. And you should just say, hey, I'm uh, Dr. Halpin. I am a child uh, and adolescent uh, psychiatry trainee. And if you need any information about mental health care, particularly mental health care for children, I volunteer to be a resource. Uh, and I, I hope that each of you at a minimum uh, do that. Here's the slide I was talking about earlier about the 75% no-show uh, rate in our clinic. We have to be about the business of meeting people where they are uh, if we really want to improve health outcomes. We have to center equity. You see that equity slide. I'm sure many of you have seen that slide. And I think that's important. I always, I know many of you have seen it, but there may be uh, folks in the room who have not. Uh, because, you know, for so long, people may have said with good intentions, well, uh, let's just give everybody the same thing, or I treat everybody equally. But the key here is if you really uh, want to make sure that you are offering equitable cares, you want to give people what they need. The littlest kid uh, there needs two boxes to, to see over the fence. Uh, and so that's what we need to think about uh, when we think about equity and making sure that we are inverting the burden of navigation away from the individual onto us as, as uh, the system. And we are all part of multiple systems. But of course, all of those systems should make sure that individuals and families are uh, centered. And I'm a big proponent, and uh, Laura mentioned this, of integrated care. Um, we I did this early on before it was kind of popular, you know, being from West Virginia, I'm a country music fan and going to show my age here, but Barbara Mandrell was a country music singer and she talked about being country before country was cool. She had a song and I, I say that I was uh, talking about and leading on integration before it was sort of popular. So I think there are so many opportunities uh, for that, a lot of work. Uh, the AMA, in fact, just uh, has a new initiative integrating, uh, working with primary care colleagues, and that's a, something else we need to do on the mental health care side is help our primary care colleagues, because we know there are not enough of us, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, there are just not enough of us. And so we have to make sure that we are creating this system uh, where we are meeting people where they are, knowing that they will probably enter uh, the first uh, entry into the system will be our primary care uh, colleagues. And I uh, talk about no wrong doors. And whether you come in for, and we did this in, in Fulton County, we had our folks who, moms who came in maybe for a uh, WIC appointments um, to receive uh, WIC benefits. Uh, we also said, all right, they have to be here. They have to be here for a couple hours waiting, going through the system. Why not talk to them about their mental health needs at the time that they are there. So you know, we have to be creative and think about a systems approach, meeting people where they are. I, I know that uh, all of you are uh, familiar with this study. Outside of this, though, many people are still just learning about the impact of adverse childhood experiences. And I think uh, in particular, understanding and appreciating the link to chronic disease. I think it may be more intuitive to think about the link with risky behaviors, um, infectious disease, some of these other issues, but I think even, uh, you know, depression and PTSD, uh, but I think we should elevate that connection, uh, and which is all the more important to figure out how to link with our primary care colleagues and make sure that when we are thinking about interventions and systems and solutions, uh, that we have that uh, broad uh, understanding. Uh, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, of course, uh, appreciating the impact of COVID on our children. And like every, unfortunately, other issue, for the most part, we see uh, disparities. If you have not seen, it's a great little brief. It probably won't be any new information, but SAMHSA 
uh, recently published a brief they called Double Jeopardy, sort of understanding the intersection of COVID and mental health. And not surprising, I imagine to anyone in this room, there are inequities. And we've seen some and we see the numbers regarding prevalence and incidence uh, change. We do know that there's been an increased incidence of suicide in Black male youth and young adults. Uh, but for the most part, the considerable issue is access to care and disparities in access to care, less likely uh, to visit a psychiatrist or, or other mental health professional, more likely to receive, and this is based on the, the uh, information from SAMHSA, culturally relevant care, uh, more likely to leave care early. And so we really have to think about this as regards mental health in general and particularly children's mental health. And I'll just, um, you know, a pop cult cultural uh, reference here. I'm a big fan of This Is Us. I don't know if anyone's a fan of This Is Us, but there was a very, I think, very critical uh, storyline uh, about a uh, character, Randall and his journey in finding a mental health professional that was a good fit for him. You know, he was adopted and struggling with that. He was, uh, he's an African-American uh, uh, man, for those of you who don't watch the, uh, the TV show, uh, it adopted into a white family. And there were a lot of issues around that and unaddressed issues for him around that. And when he went to uh, his first therapist, I, she was great. And, you know, we always, uh, of course it's TV. Uh, uh, and oh, I can. I think we all know the the history sometimes of how they portray psychiatrists and other mental health uh, professionals in TV and the movies, and that of course has added uh, to the stigma. But his first, uh, I think she was a psychiatrist, but she was a white woman and great, and I loved. And it was realistic, actually, even as realistic as you can be on TV. But it wasn't a good fit for him. He did not feel that she understood some of his issues regarding being an African-American male. And so he found uh, someone who did, and then he also found a support group uh, for children who have been adopted in mixed race families. And so, uh, you know, we really have to think about all those issues as we address uh, as we address those disparities. I'm going to, I get so excited that we don't have a lot of time. I'll run through some of these. I've already made the, um, the point, I think, about mental health inequities. But again, enough about the problems, as I say, let's talk about the solutions. You may have seen uh, the AMA board. We did this last June, pledging action on racism. Uh, a lot of people pledged action. A lot of people develop the statement, right? The key is what are we going to do beyond this statement? It's got to be more than performative, right? And when people ask me, can you, Dr. Harris, would you be willing to consult with us or just even if it's a one time consultation, I ask, are you really serious about this? Are you beyond the performative? And so for the AMA, we are a policy making organization. And so it was about once we made that statement in June, did we back that up with policy? Uh, in uh, November, and we did. And by the way, this was before even the CDC, they just uh, came out with their announcement about racism being a, a public health threat. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we launched our Center for Health Equity in 2019 with our first Chief Health Equity Officer, Dr. Aletha Maybank. And so this is again, a metaphor for any organization. Uh, at the AMA, we talk about embedding uh, equity, health equity into the DNA of our organization. And if you look at one of our drawings, we health equity is an accelerator, right? It, it's, it's, it surrounds all of our work. And so any large institution needs to really look at that. And by the way, the CEO has to own, and what I am so proud of the AMA, by the way, let me just say, uh, the AMA is not without its blemishes. You know that for many years, black physicians could not join. Uh, you, and more recently, we had the issue around the drama uh, podcast. We gave away the Nathan Davis Awards for many uh, years, a big award ceremony in DC every year for outstanding service in government. And by the way, um, the, the, the people who have won those awards over the years still deserve that uh, acknowledgement, but we just retired that name. We no longer use uh, Nathan Davis's name because he was one of the key physicians uh, who uh, did not want black physicians to join the AMA. Uh, we talk about the Flexner report in all of its context, right? Uh, Flexner was 
Um, yeah, I wasn't in the minds of the folks, you know, when the Flexner report was commissioned, but um, the end result was several uh, black medical schools were shut down. Was that intentional? I don't know. Uh, but we have to talk about these issues in their full uh, context. One of the first AMA presidents or president around the uh, slavery uh, operated on enslaved uh, women uh, without um, anesthesia. So again, not without our blemishes. I want to say that because I'm about truth telling and authenticity. But here we are today on our journey in any institution, UCLA, uh, you know, it's any institution has, it's a journey, right? No, no one is there yet, uh, but it, we've launched this center and we're very proud of the work. Um, you should uh, look forward in the next few days uh, for the uh, strategic plan. Of course, we can't uh, forget the basics, remaining uh, work to be done to make sure we are continuing to protect patient access to care. Uh, many of you know that the AMA supported the Affordable Care Act and we believe the best path forward is to uh, move, uh, build on the progress of the Affordable Care Act. Of course, with mental health being fully integrated, uh, we talk a lot about this with opioid use disorder, uh, but the fact is we have to make sure, and of course I talked to you about our recent um, uh, project, but we have to make sure that we are integrating mental health into our overall health care. And as we work towards uh, diversity in medicine, we have several uh, areas of focus here for, with our own institution uh, through the courts, uh, supporting our international medical graduates who uh, serve under-resourced uh, and uh, underserved uh, communities. We continue to work through our AMA Accelerating Change in Medical Education Initiative to expand uh, the physician uh, pipeline. So there's a lot of work to do at, at can uh, seem overwhelming. By the way, again, it's okay not to be okay. There have been days uh, during this pandemic where I have not been okay. A lot of issues around police injustice in this country over the last uh, year, as you know, uh, that have been particularly traumatic for everyone, but particularly traumatic uh, for uh, those of us in the African-American community have we seen that disproportionate impact. So there's a lot on our to-do list, a lot of things to worry about, but leadership is going to be required. And I am committed to continuing that work. But on the days where I get a little bit discouraged, I remember Amanda Gorman. And I don't know about you, but uh, Inauguration Day, she was so inspiring to me. And uh, when I get discouraged and about our long to-do list and the work yet ahead, I remember her words, as you see on this slide, particularly uh, that last, couple of sentences where she says, so while once we ask, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? And so I use that every day on the days that I get uh, discouraged. And uh, I hope uh, that that could be encouraging to you as well. And so I thank you for the opportunity uh, to be with you today. And I look forward to um, and questions some of you may know, I'd planned to spend most of the afternoon with you, but my 86 year old dad fell last week. And by the way, and so the end result, he's doing okay. I mean, he's 86 and he did fall, uh, but he's doing okay, but he's being transferred to subacute uh, facility uh, today. So I'll have to, I won't, be, I won't be able to spend the next 15 minutes for questions and then the next hour, uh, but I hope to be able to reschedule some one-on-one -on -one time with you. So thank you. All right, thanks so much, Dr. Harris. That was great, very, very inspiring. Um, and I think it was especially helpful to hear kind of how you how you concluded the talk with Amanda Gorman's poem. Um, I think one, one of the things I, I was gonna ask, or I was just wondering, I feel like as a trainee and seeing so many of my fellow trainees here on the participants list is just, it can sometimes seem so daunting to like find a place to have this power to change the systems to, to keep at it. Um, and I know kind of sharing the, the poetry is, is one inspiration, but I wonder if you could share any more and just how you how you keep doing it and how you have, have the strength to, to keep making these changes. Well, I would say pick, pick one thing, right? Start with picking one thing, one thing that you are passionate about, whether that's inside of, uh, you know, psychiatry or mental health, our, our profession or outside. 
and just do that one thing, just make a call, send an email to your legislator. When you see legislation being considered, policy being considered, make a call, right? So I, I would just say, pick one thing. I would say to the trainees, um, you know, your, your most important job is to do, continue to do what you are doing. Uh, which is becoming and learning and training in your journey, right? We are always learning as as uh, in the healthcare. Uh, but so your job is to do all that you can to become the best, whatever profession uh, you've you've chosen. I know we may have trainees from psychiatry and psychology and others, uh, but do pick one thing. I, I would say pick one thing if you really are passionate and you want to get involved. And advocacy is so important. Listen, there there are so many um, decisions are made. Uh, at the legislative level and the policy making level that impact our ability to take care of our patients. So I would say pick one thing, start small, know that you can't do everything. And by the way, be a team. So Laura, you and I could think and I could say, okay, I'll work on this, you, you work on that. And so pick your teams as, as trainees, you can say, look, the six of us, we care about these six issues. Each one of us take an issue, right? Um, and so we need to use teams, we need to use allies and partners. Um, and we can start small. And again, we have the opportunity to lead in tiny spheres, uh, spheres of influence. I would say um, sharing your, and I'll just say the last thing and then get to other questions. Um, we have a front row seat to what's wrong with our many systems, with healthcare, transportation. And so we have the stories and the narratives to tell those who have the power and the privilege to make the decision. So tell your story. That's great, thank you. Um, and yeah, anyone else who has questions, please just continue to send them in. We have a few here. Um, and so one of the questions is, how can we as mental health professionals help reduce the stigma of mental health care for communities in need? So I think uh, we know stigma is uh, caused uh, by, or as a result of people having a, a lack of information. So that gets back to that opportunity to make sure uh, that people have accurate information. But again, if we want to eradicate stigma, which we all do, we have to go to where the stigma is, right? And so we uh, can't stay at the AMA if I really want to, I have to go to the community and I've done a lot of work uh, with churches, uh, you know, and over the years, uh, because, you know, there, there's some, was and still is, uh, some, particularly in the Black church, that, well, if you have a, a mental disorder, you are, you didn't pray hard enough, right? And so, or if you may, may be a psychotic, that you are po possessed by demons. And so I've spent a good bit of my time, good bit of my time working with, you um, ministers and other faith uh, leaders. So you have to go to where the stigma is, volunteer your time. Again, you don't have a lot of time, but again, this is picking one thing. So here's another thing you could do. You could do a, give a lecture. You could give a mental health 101 lecture uh, to the local X club, you know, your, your sorority, your, uh, you know, the local um, do-gooders club as I, you know, so uh, that that's how we have to go to where the stigma is. And this I know goes without saying, but um, you know, just meet people where they are, non-judgmental. I, I was asked this question. I just gave commencement address at West Virginia Wesley, and, and a couple of folks came up and said, "Can you give us advice? We are so frustrated with our family members who won't uh, get the vaccine." And I said, "Just meet people where they are, and be persistent, and say, listen, I'm here. I want to be your source of information because you'd rather they come to you, even though it's frustrating." then go to the internet and find, uh, you know, all of the uh, misinformation, disinformation out there. So st start small, but go to where the stigma is. Thanks, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so another another question kind of asking about the, the trauma anticipated kind of in the aftermath of the coronavirus, if, if we can even start to talk about the aftermath of the coronavirus yet, um, but, any thoughts on how community groups or, or us in general can lessen the trauma and this acute impact versus, you know, maybe waiting till years down the road, um, you know, for this mental health crisis to grow? So more. we should be planning now. Actually, we should have been planning, you know, for the last, we were not prepared. 
uh, for this pandemic. I actually led public health department here in Atlanta, Fulton County for five years. And I started, I think my first week was H1N1. And so we dodged a bullet then, uh, but we didn't do what we needed to do, right? And there, by the way, were lots of plans on paper but did we, uh, did we have tabletop exercises? And I know some did, the Obama administration did, but, and so locally, so we should be planning right now. So you should be planning right now how you will outreach to communities, right? Again, not waiting, but outreach, get in there early, recommend that folks come to care early. Now, now here is the thing, if we recommend that folks come to care early, are we going to, do we have the bandwidth to provide that early care? So here's where right now systems should be thinking and planning. What are our resources? And not just there at UCLA, so that I know, I know it's a huge area and population out there, but getting a group together, sort of like we got everyone together when we were uh, doing the tabletop exercises, we got all the hospitals together, you know, we're, you know, again, prepping for H1N1. Um, and so we did those tabletop exercises. So now people should be doing tabletop exercises. What is the system, mental health system like in, in the, your county or region, however you want to um, divide that up? Who can provide what? And so is there a FQHC there? Again, and this, you know, and I and I get there's sometimes there's competition and I and I and I get that, but we really have to make sure that we are sort of planning and we have a resource guide. And when we tell people to get care, care and encourage folks to get care, we have to make sure care is available. To, to me, the, I don't want to say the worst thing, I try not to um, talk in hyperbolic terms, but you know, one, one issue is regarding vaccine um, questions. And when folks, we some of us work really hard to get folks to change their minds about vaccines, they weren't available. And so someone said that's like encouraging someone, yes, to jump off the high dive. Yes, yes, yes. And then they get to the high dive and look over and there's no water in the pool. So all of that work, I won't say it's been for naught, but uh, so anyway, plan right now as a system there, but with your community. Thanks, thanks. All right, so we probably have time for one last question. Um, and so this question is asking um, kind of about the AMA's role um, in the interaction between police and patients, you know, what, can, what is the AMA doing? What can the AMA be doing? So, and I didn't uh, have this on a slide, but, um, and usually I have this on the slide, maybe the, the team took it out and I didn't get a chance to add it. But uh, last year when I was president, Jesse Ehrenfeld was chair of the board, we did put out a statement on uh, police brutality. And by the way, just so you know, um, AMA already had policy on the books about discriminatory policing. And so Jesse Ehrenfeld and I put forth a statement and Laura knows this just this past November at our policy making uh, session, we adopted new policy. And by the way, if you ever wanna know whether or not AMA has policy on any topic and by the, it's, odds are we do, you could go to our website, find the policy finder, type in a couple of search words and you will see. So the AMA is not a programmatic organization, right? Our, our, our power is in our policy. And uh, our policy is used on the state and, and, and federal level. And so we have significant policy that each of you can use in your day-to-day, -day, in your own sphere of influence uh, that folks can, can implement. Uh, you know, we have to have those tough conversations we have to have, and this is a particular conversation that we have to have in the mental health community. And again, there's no one right answer, but we have to work with our local uh, police departments on who should respond to mental health emergencies. We've seen some uh, innovative programs. In, in fact, and this is interesting, 20 years ago, maybe longer, I can't remember, I was a part of two programs here in the metro area and each county decided to do something different. So Fulton County um, had a team go out, a police officer was on the team, but they, they were not in a police uniform. I think they had a black polo and tan pants. And they went out in, in a car that was labeled probably the Department of Mental Health, right? And so that's how they did it. Now, DeKalb County did, did send a therapist, a two licensed master's prepared clinicians out in a police car. You, we can debate and try to 
decide which was right. The point was actually 20 years ago, uh, there was at least an attempt of that partnership. So I think where we can uh, make some difference there is talk to our local police jurisdictions about what's going on and who should respond. I think we, we need to uh, weigh in. This is my personal opinion, by the way, not AMA's opinion, but I'm worried and I, about, um, and someone help me now, the, um, using uh, you know the excited delirium. Mm -hmm. That's not, I have not seen that. Please someone tell me that's not in DSM-5. Delirium is in DSM-5, but this is a term that some folks have decided is a thing, it's not a thing. And, uh, and we have to weigh in on that again as a, as a profession. Um, I don't know if anyone has a comment on that, but that's something I think, and again, that's my personal op opinion, we need to weigh in. So that's uh, what we need to be doing. Lots of other work regarding, but it's partnering with police and saying, we can help you. You know, the Department of Psychiatry, we, if you have any questions, let us guide you. We will help you with the science. We could tell them that excited delirium does not exist. Definitely, definitely. Okay, I think that brings us to about noon. Um, so we can probably wrap up. Um, I don't know if you have any final thoughts, final, any concluding, anything? <laughs> well, just I thank everyone uh, for the um, opportunity and, uh, you know, thank you again. And uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, as, as you say, Laura, I'm not sure where we are in this pandemic, but, um, you know, mental health, and there's an opportunity, I'll just say this, um, people are talking about mental health in ways that they've not talked about it before. And by the way, there's some money uh, that has already been allocated for opioid use, but more money around mental health. Now, one of the things that I have been saying uh, uh, loudly, uh, I think the Biden administration, so we have an equity task force, we need a mental health task force at the uh, administration level. And at the very least, there should be several uh, I think there are one, maybe one, but there should be more um, folks, uh, including a psychiatrist on the uh, COVID task force, right? Because we we should be integrated, right? This is an important piece of the work. So let's continue to advocate on behalf of our profession and our patients. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Dr. Harris. This was really great. Thank you.